Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astroimaging Channel. It's good to have you back here tonight. We're with a bunch of really concerned astroimagers in the in the pre-meeting here, and we have some good ideas that we'll be telling you about in the next, well, in the next little while, let's just say. Um, all we want to tell you about a few things that are going to be happening, and among the things that are going to be happening is, um, well, let me get my screen sharing stuff here. Oh, I've disappeared. Um, we've got a calendar to look at in the first place. And the calendar is not as full as it should be. We've got um, Connor. Connor's going to be here today. He's going to be telling us about satellite data and how to make really pretty pictures out of some really nice equipment you know, that, that's flying around in space right now, satellite uh, t telescopes and things like that. He's going to show us how to take advantage of that and make our own pictures. Uh, Ron Brecher is going to be coming here next week. Uh, and then we're going to have hunting for asteroids. And and on August 8th, we've got a special program for you. Uh, uh, many of you have contributed to Gorgeous Galaxies taking and sending in pictures. I think we had like about 100 uh, pictures in Arno. Um, has put them all together into a lovely 10-minute show that he's going to show us and tell us how he did it and all that other stuff. So that'll be on August 8th. After that, uh, you know, to, um, we're going to have Eric uh, and Tim are going to be telling us about, about some topics for astro astronomical imaging. And uh, maybe I'll be doing some of that. Kind of short things, uh, little ideas that will make your imaging better. Um, and we want to see if it's a good model for some other things we want to do later. Uh, then Rory, remember Rory was going to tell us about Next Dome, but we had a power failure and lost the internet that weekend. Uh, Rory's going to be back telling us about how he built his Next Dome out of GMARS. And uh, then uh, Dave Giesen is going to be coming to tell us about the uh, cleaning glass systems and things like that. But then you'll notice we don't have anybody after that. And, uh, you know, this program is you're in charge of it. We need your help to bring people in and uh, get us signed up for other people. So please, uh, we need volunteers to be putting on shows for you here. Okay. Um, we haven't decided yet what our next contribution is going to be in, in TAIC shots. We have changed the websites in order to tell you we are no longer doing, um, we're no longer accepting the um, uh, images for the galaxy. So don't send any more in, please. That that production's already finished and we're ready to go on that. Uh, but we will have another thing. We just haven't decided on the topics. We encourage you to continue over in the YouTube stream to tell us anything over here that you might have um, about, um, you know, any topics for the next time we do uh, tech shots, T-A-I-C shots, and that is when you guys are contributing to um, to the program by sending in whatever images. But we don't know which type of images we're going to ask for next. Anyway, enough of me. Uh, let's get back over to Connor. Connor, you ready to start sharing? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to get out of here, and I think you can have it now. Let's see. Is it all set? I believe you're going good. All yeah. right. Awesome. We're, now we're seeing your show. Okay. Perfect. All right, Alex. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Uh, you know, thank you for everyone who decided to tune in today. Uh, and also, you know, thank you, uh, Tim and Terry for, you know, both inviting me onto the show. Uh, Terry had actually invited me back in February of last year, I believe it was maybe January. And then uh, Tim actually ended up inviting me again. So I figured after the second time, I couldn't say no, I had to come on eventually. Uh, but for those of you who do not know me, my name is Connor Mathern. I am an astrophotographer, uh, but I am also a planetary scientist. So I actually graduated from LSU. Let's see. I finished grad school in 2019 of December. So a little, a little bit out. But just to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking to you about like how what I did as a planetary scientist has some overlap with astrophotography. And that's basically what the intro of, you know, the presentation is going to be about. And I'll give you a little bit more background on me, what my research was. Uh, but then I'm going to be talking about 
the hardware that we're going to be dealing with. So whenever we do astrophotography, we generally deal with a telescope and a mount and a camera. But instead, we're going to be dealing with satellites. So satellites have a lot of similar things to what we have, but a lot of not so similar things. So I'll be going over different satellites and how they differ. Uh, and then I'll be jumping into the software side of things. So similarly, there is a lot of software that we use uh, that is overlapped by what we can use to analyze satellite data. Sadly, there's also a lot of software that does not overlap, but on the bright side, a lot of it is free, uh, especially because a lot of it is made by NASA. So it just kind of comes with the territory of here's some free data, here's some free software to process it uniquely. Uh, but then, you know, of course, what can we learn from these? And at the very end, we're going to make two different images using satellite data. I am going to walk you all through it. And hopefully uh, you can either follow along or do it so at a later date. Uh, but we are going to be making some pretty pictures, to say the least. So in terms of what satellites will actually be going over, we have Cassini. Uh, a lot of these y'all have probably heard of, but some of them you may not have. So Cassini was a satellite that was orbiting Saturn. It is no longer orbiting Saturn, uh, but it has taken pretty much any picture you've seen of Saturn that you're like, wow, that's a pretty picture, with exception of maybe a handful. Uh, chances are Cassini had taken that picture. Similarly, Juno is actually kind of the equivalent that is flying around Jupiter. So Juno is a bit newer and is actually still in the process of just snapping away, taking a bunch of pictures. Uh, just like Cassini, though, if you've seen an amazing picture of Jupiter, chances are it was taken by Juno. Then we have Hubble, probably the most famous of all satellites that have taken some pictures. Uh, if you tell anyone, uh, hey, do you have like a favorite space picture? Nine times out of 10, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, this picture Hubble took. Uh, even if they don't realize that Hubble took it, chances are their favorite picture is something that Hubble took, whether it's, you know, Pillars of Creation, uh, the Hubble Deep Field. Hubble is just an absolute cannon with, you know, a giant light bucket. Uh, and even though it might be, you know, over two decades old at this point and constantly getting updates, it is still just it, it dwarfs what we can do on Earth, even still. Then we're going to get into my bread and butter, which is uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So that's what my research was around. And just like all these other ones, it has countless instruments on it uh, that can measure, you know, elevation, infrared, UV, uh, the list goes on. Um, then lastly, you have New Horizons, uh, that one you might not recognize, but that was actually the one that took the pictures of Pluto as well as some other uh, what are the dwarf planets out there. Uh, it has returned some absolutely amazing images, uh, but sadly, just like Cassini, it is no longer, well, it might actually be sending back data. I don't know, don't quote me on that. Uh, as far as I know though, it is actually, you know, its mission is completed at least. So the ones we'll actually be making pictures with though, uh, we're going to start off with Hubble because I figure that is what a lot of people know if they're into astrophotography. Uh, they might not have ever downloaded any Hubble data, though. Uh, so hopefully I can show you, you know, how easy it is to download some Hubble data, process it. Uh, we won't spend long on it. It's not going to be like an hour and a half tutorial on how to process Hubble data, you know, five, ten minutes. And then we're going to go over to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And I'm going to show you how to edit high-rise data, which is the camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that has super, super fine detail. Uh, a single pixel on the high-rise camera is about 20 centimeters on the surface of Mars. And some of these pictures can get over 100,000 pixels long. So we're going to be dealing with some giant files and some super high-resolution images. And honestly, my favorite part of it is so many of the pictures that are on high-rise. Like it has over 70,000 pictures I think it's taken at this point. So many of them have never been processed. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we can pick some random image that has never been touched before and create an entirely new image right here on the stream for y'all. So a little bit about me. I graduated with my undergrad and grad school from LSU. Uh, little picture of me when I was doing my grad photos for my undergrad there. Um, so like any good geologist, I was holding my favorite mineral uh, for my graduation pictures. 
That's actually the first mineral I ever had as well. It's a chrysocolla malachite sample. Uh, that was uh, forced on me though, because the uh, the graduation pictures were forced on me. Uh, my mom uh, <laughs> was dying for me to have them. So I was running around frantically with my rock and my camera uh, trying to get graduation pictures done. And apparently I had my hat backwards. Uh, but then on the right, that was actually a picture of me doing some research out in Louisiana. Uh, so there's a little feature out there called the Brushy Creek feature. And it is the potential only impact feature we know of in Louisiana. Uh, it is potential. It isn't confirmed yet. Uh, that's part of the work I was doing out there. We were actually inserting metal rods and sending electricity through them and getting resistivity uh, measurements. And that sort of allows us to know uh, what is happening underneath the ground. Just, you know, one of the other many millions of remote sensing techniques that, you know, while I might not be a satellite, uh, I'm not actively observing what's under the ground. I am remotely observing it. That's, you know, what we're going to be doing today. So most of my work that was more traditionally uh, remote sensing was my work on Mars. And that's kind of why I know the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter so well. So many people have heard of Mars 2020, or sorry, Mars Perseverance uh, used to be referred to as 2020. Uh, it is the uh, rover that had just landed in Jezero Crater. Uh, and so a long, long time ago when I was in grad school, that location was not decided upon yet. And I was actually part of the team that was helping decide where are we going to put this thing? So actually, if we look up here, can you all see my cursor? Actually, I don't know. Does my cursor show on the screen? Yes, it does. Perfect. Okay. So here's Jezero Crater right up here, which is actually where it landed. Uh, but this area right here in this top center image is known as Northeast Sirtis. And it was one of the finalists in terms of uh, locations that Perseverance was looking to be sent to. And that's because it is some of the oldest rocks on Mars, uh, which is what we were looking for for biosignatures, uh, but also because it has huge implications for uh, water on Mars. And Jezero is unique in that, you know, a lot of people have seen the giant, beautiful picture of Jezero's fan. Uh, and that's because Jezero is like a classic delta, which is generally where we find rivers emptying into an ocean. It's a geologic feature. Uh, however, right to the south of here, we actually have a huge lava ice interaction area. And with both of these being around the same age, one of the things that we've always debated in planetary science uh, is the existence of a global ocean on Mars. And I like to kind of consider a global ocean, I call it kind of like a, a sexy theory and that it always gets picked up in the news. Everyone has heard of Mars having an ocean, uh, but it isn't proven and a sort of equally, uh, you know, backed up by science theory is that Mars was actually covered by gigantic, you know, many kilometer thick sheets of ice. Uh, the issue is, is that it's a little bit harder to prove the ice, even though our climate modeling says, oh, Nothing about ice should exist here. So that was one area where we found actual existence of lava interacting with ice. And then on the right, you actually have some pictures from uh, that sampling that I was doing out at that Brushy Creek feature. Uh, up at the top, you have some small little grains of zircons where you can see different zoning from their growth. Uh, those are microscopic pictures of little bitty, uh, I don't know, like sand size grains, I would call them. Uh, on the bottom actually is a sand grain. Uh, that is a shocked quartz. If you're ever interested in what one of those look like from something that might have been an impact, but I can't say it is definitely an impact, although I think it's an impact. <laughs> but I started in astrophotography when I was in college, and I actually started off by borrowing my brother's telescope. He hadn't touched it and you know, oh, geez, I don't know, maybe over a decade at this point. He's my older brother. And I, I brought it back with me to college. And I, I plopped it outside my apartment and pointed at the first thing in the sky and, of course, you know, land right on Jupiter. Uh, if only I knew how lucky I was. I didn't align it or anything. Uh, that would never happen again. I can't even do that with the moon nowadays. It's awful. If only I really did not realize how lucky I was. Uh, but here are just some of, you know, my first pictures. You know, we have Saturn, uh, my first planet, Andromeda, my first galaxy, Milky Way, first moon, first nebula. And then, you know, first like guided telescope out there, a little cold, had like a little space heater with me because everything was freezing over, which is relatively rare for Louisiana. Uh, but then we have, you know, some more recent pictures. We have like a Milky Way panorama from Joshua Tree, uh, a moon picture that I did with collaboration with Andrew McCarthy, 
uh, an eclipse image, uh, North American and Pelican Nebula, my most recent nebula, and then the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, my most recent galaxy image. Uh, I've you know been doing astrophotography now for honestly I don't even think like six years maybe at this point. I'm at the point where I'm losing track and I'm still young so I don't have an excuse. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but. Cassini. So Cassini is the first satellite I wanted to talk to you all about. So satellite is decommissioned. Um, and what that means is you might think like, oh, it, it broke. It, it didn't break. And that's one of the things that I think is actually really interesting about Cassini is that one of the things Cassini was studying around Saturn is Saturn's moons. Uh, so Saturn is famous for having all these moons that are uh, covered in organic molecules, not life, but sort of like the building blocks for life. And the issue is, you know, we've never like gone down to like, you know, the surface of these moons and like really, really studied them or like, you know, drilled through the ice to like look at the briny oceans, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, but the issue is, is that we do know at least there are organic molecules there. So uh, Cassini, even though it's been floating around in space for so long, and even though they were so careful when they were building it, they didn't want to keep running Cassini and accidentally have something happen where, oh, it crashes on to Titan, for example, and there are some organic material on Cassini that made its way from Earth and it survived in outer space and then it crashes on Titan and then we completely pollute a planet. So it actually crashed into Saturn. They purposefully dove Cassini into Saturn in order for it to burn up into the atmosphere because we're not worried about life on Saturn. You know, at least, you know, we're more worried about it accidentally crashing in the Titan or something. So kind of just, you know, mission was complete. It took way too many photos, uh, way more than it was expected to. And they just, you know, sent it to its death. And there's a whole like little montage you can watch online of it like crashing through the surface. Uh, actually, if, whenever I show you how to download the Saturn data, if you look at the Saturn data and sort it by date, you can actually like, as the feed rolls, you can see like its last photos getting sent to earth of it just crashing through the atmosphere. Uh, but it also has uh, the Hyogen's probe attached to it. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It's like a Dutch, named after a Dutch scientist, I think. But that was a probe that was... I think it's... I think it's, it's I've heard I've heard Huygens. Huygens? Okay, I'll take Huygens. You know what? I'll Huygens have... or, or Huygens, I think, are both kind of common. So that was a probe that was sent to Titan, I believe in order to sort of, you know, take some pictures as it was like descending through the atmosphere and stuff. Another like great set of pictures. Uh, but in terms of like instruments that uh, Cassini had, it had IR, optical, UV, had a plasma spectrometer, had a cosmic dust analyzer, which essentially like imagine there's like a little bucket on it. And as it would like swoop in and out of uh, the rings, which it would do kind of like a, kind of like imagine like a dolphin going in and out of the water, I guess. Uh, as it would pass through, uh, the grains would fly into that bucket, and as it would, they would fly into that bucket, it would scan them, know their size, uh, know their densities, like know how much of it there was, and then because it's traveling at you know thousands of miles per hour, it would hit the back of that bucket, the rocks and particles would explode, and then at the back of that sensor, it would then take a measurement based off of uh, what that like crushed up fine dust is now that like, you know, you pulverize the material and it would be able to analyze it from that. Uh, an ion neutral mass spectrometer, a magnetometer, a mag the list goes on and on. And that's kind of the case for all of these rovers. They have so many different instruments on them that can detect so many different things. Um, the issue is, is what can we make a pretty picture out of? Like, what is usable for us as astrophotographers? Like, what is something we could have fun with? Uh, and the things like IR, optical, UV, like those are our bread and butter, really. Uh, a cosmic dust analyzer, you can't really make a pretty picture out of. Uh, a magnetometer, you might be able to. Like, you can make some cool maps of the surface, but really, like, those are where we will be for the majority of this presentation. Uh, for instance, we have IR here. So IR is infrared. And one thing that's cool about infrared is that it actually, I mean, it's kind of people, know, it's something that we know, but we kind of forget is that IR is, you know, uh, you know, thermal radiation. Uh, so 
one great thing about IR is that you know you can see these differences in temperature, and that's actually something that's huge on uh, Mars on the Themis instrument, which is their thermal inertia imagery. Uh, however, on things like Saturn, it's really good at telling us various compositions as well as the aurora. So right there, you can see the green at the bottom of Saturn there. So there are a bunch of aurora down there and those show up great in IR. And then we actually have another very useful use of IR and that is being able to see through dust and gas. Uh, so I think the pillars image shows this just excellently. Uh, on the left, we have the visible wavelengths where it's nothing but gas and dust, which is just, oh, it's beautiful. But whenever you image it in IR, you can see just how many stars there are hiding behind all of that gas and all of that dust. And then we move on to optical. So this is where pretty much all of the eye candy exists. These are, in my opinion, your prettiest pictures. And I find them also prettiest because they are, you know, they're in our visible wavelength. They're not... Uh, I mean, I hope by the end of this, you realize that those other pictures like aren't doctored or like painted or anything like that. Uh, but the optical is just straight up visible wavelength. And here's a great example of like what's achievable with optical wavelength. So you might notice there's like a bunch of haze around Saturn and that's actually a bunch of dust that you can see around Saturn uh, whenever you have the sun and Saturn and then you put Cassini behind it. So Essentially, Cassini was sitting in the eclipse of Saturn. So kind of like how you can see the sun's atmosphere during a lunar eclipse or during a solar eclipse, uh, you can sort of see, you know, the outer edges of Saturn when you put Saturn in between you and the sun. And then you have UV, though. So UV, in this case, will tell us, you know, a lot of compositional differences. Uh, and in this case, specifically in this image, uh, the blue equates to more ice. So, you know, what is that telling us in this case? Uh, this is, you know, has to go back to, uh, from the scientific side, how did Saturn's rings form? Uh, did they form all at once? Did they form in stages? Uh, so when you see this, like, compositional banding, it gets interesting. But especially when you see a lack of ice towards those inner rings and then much more ice as you go towards the outer rings, uh, it's sort of comes to mind like, like why is it distributed that way and you know why do you have that thick band of no ice right there in the center you know these are all things that uh, images like this uv image can tell us other than you know like the point of this isn't to you know get a crazy colored picture of saturn's rings the point of it is to determine you know scientific things like how did these rings form and why did they form in the you know pattern that they did and like uv can help us with that so whenever you go to download data, there are tons of different websites that NASA has that will help you download data. This is the PDS, also known as the Planetary Data System. It carries pretty much everything you could ever imagine. In this case, it has over 128,000 images from Cassini, which is, like I said, way too many. I, I could never <laughs> look through that many as much as I tried. Uh, but you can go there, you can download the raw data, you can search by whatever target you're looking for, like if you want to get look at pictures of Titan, Saturn, uh, the F ring, G ring, uh, Janus, like you name it, like you can click it, you can search it, uh, and then you can essentially do what we're going to do later in this presentation with these pictures. Uh, moving on to Juno. So like I mentioned, this one is actually still in orbit, it's a bit younger. Uh, it has actually i don't know what they plan on doing with this i don't know if they plan on crashing it into jupiter or just kind of letting it go until it breaks sort of thing uh but i'm sure that information's out there but sort of like cassini it has tons of sensors you know gravity magnetometer microwave like uh here's one i really like though jupiter energetic particle detector instrument uh the acronym for it is jedi uh just to remind you that you know scientists are still a bunch of nerds who like to put little jokes on their science fair projects, even when they cost a lot of money. <laughs> but the Jovian Auroral Distributions Experiment, WAVES, Ultraviolet Imaging, you know, Infrared, and JunoCam. And if you were to guess which three I would like to talk about real quick, yes, yeah, these last three. So I won't actually go into detail because I'm not a fan of all this text on these slides. I would rather show you pictures. 
So just know that UV and IR on Juno sort of works similar to UV and IR on Cassini. It's important, but, you know, it's not in, inherently different from one to the next. And, you know, similar with Juno Cam, it's uh, a lot of optical. It's purely optical, sorry. Juno is optical, and that's like a majority of the pictures you see are a combo of all three of those whenever you're looking at Juno data. That's why they're generally a little green and a little purple. So just like uh, Saturn, though, here is Juno's uh, website, or sorry, just like Cassini. Here's Juno's website. You can download away all of these great pictures of Jupiter. Here just happens to be the most recent picture. So we have the PJ34 Southern Circumpolar Cyclones. Uh, I don't know what those are, but those sound super interesting. So if you're interested in processing some data on uh, Jupiter, the newest images sound great. Uh, moving on to New Horizons, so this is another one, uh, mission complete. So it had visible IR, UV, radio, a telescopic camera, solar wind and plasma spectrometer, and an energetic particle spectrometer, and then a student dust counter. So it's kind of like what Cassini had, but it was led by students. And I just wanted to point that out because that's really cool. It was a, a student project that made it on to this thing, and, you know, it worked. It was a successful tool, but, you know... It, New Horizons took some absolutely stunning images of Pluto, and this is, you know, I'm on page 151 out of 225, um, and there are just so many pictures in here, like you can see here, of Pluto's surface that uh, I've never seen in the news. Like, that's the thing. There are so many of these absolutely stunning pictures, if you will, that, you know, never make it to the news, never make it to some news article. Uh, but they are absolutely beautiful. They've just never been processed or never have had uh, like uh, a headline associated with them. So most people will never see them, you know. Uh, so moving on to software. So if you are a geologist or a geographer, chances are you are familiar with ArcGIS. Uh, pretty much all of my work uh, surrounds ArcGIS. It is a mapping software. Uh, sorry, Esri, the company that owns this, but I hate your software. The only reason I use it is because I have to. Uh, it costs a lot of money, so I would not recommend it to anyone here if you don't already have access to it. But there is software known as QGIS, which is a free version of that. So if you ever wanted to get into mapping any of these planets, software like QGIS would be great. And here's, oops, sorry, here's kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is an older picture of its interface, but here is a picture of Mars. And you can see uh, elevation modeling going on. You can see some rivers that are mapped out on Mars. That's kind of what you do in it. You map out things, you map out elevations, and then because it's all geographically tied together, it makes creating you know, maps and manipulating that data all the easier. And if you download any of these data sets, uh, chances are they're already registered in a coordinate system. So you can just upload them directly to things like ARC or QGIS, and they will automatically sort of mesh together, if you will. Uh, also, they can do things like this, which I love, and I will never get tired of looking at. This is a digital elevation model. So you basically take that elevation data, you exaggerate it uh, vertically uh, to make it really show up like this, and then you apply some photographic uh, layering over it, and you end up with an absolutely stunning model of, in this case, a Martian crater wall. Uh, it is just, in my mind, the coolest thing that we can get from, like, Martian data, other than, you know, just, it's difficult to make this, but it is, oh, it's so cool. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I could look at that forever. Uh, but here's a icon everyone knows, the, the familiar blue square, or a cube, I guess. Uh, so this is PixInsight. Uh, this is something that uh, astrophotographers, I assume, either have or are at least familiar with. Uh, if you don't have PixInsight, anything I do in PixInsight, uh, you can replicate in Photoshop. Photoshop is another great alternative. Uh, nothing I'm going to be doing is, at least in, in this, to, uh, not tutorial, but presentation, uh, is going to be picks inside exclusive. We're mainly just going to be combining like RGB and doing curves and stuff. Uh, here's just a general idea of what the software for picks inside looks like. If you've never seen it, 
And here's kind of what we'll be working with, you know, RGB filters and then creating some great pictures of the Martian surface. Uh, and last but not least, uh, NASA JPL is not a uh, software. Uh, it's a, you know, NASA itself, but they create tons and tons of software uh, that is free that you might need to download to manipulate specific sets of data. Uh, you don't always need to download it, but sometimes it helps. For instance, uh, when we go to do high rise later in the presentation, I'm going to download high view. When I download high view, you don't have to have it, but it makes manipulating those like 100,000 long resolution photos that high rise makes way easier. Uh, Cause if you just straight up download them off of high rises website, we would be sitting here for a very long time. So it makes it a lot easier to just crop them down and you know know what you're working with. Uh, but in an instance where you can't just straight up uh, like, oh, just download something and wait a little bit longer, uh, there is JCAT, which is the Java Prism Analytical Tool, I think. I think that's right. Uh, but that is another tool on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that looks at infrared. So if you've ever seen that like rainbow picture of Jezero Crater, that rainbow picture of Jezero Crater or like any rainbowy picture of the Martian surface, chances are that is infrared data that has been edited edited in JCAT. And what that data is telling us is actually mineralogical differences. And I'll actually go over that in just one second. Uh, but Connor? Yes. Are, are you going to put up a list or a link to this bits of software that we might be interested in downloading? So, uh, that list might be really long, uh, depending on what you're looking for. I would say for this presentation, the only ones that I would ever suggest, or even like if you just want to do this for fun. Uh, so most of this software, uh, like if you need specific software, for instance, like this Chrism software, if you needed this, it is on Chrism's website and it tells you like, hey, go here to download the software to manipulate the data or like if we go back to here for the uh, let's see the juno one you have an image processing tab which it walks you through how to like download the data and what software you'll need to like work through it and any like hiccups you might run across does that make sense sure and you mentioned it was a qgis yes qgis is the free mapping software and where would we find that so qgis i think I think you should just be able to download. So yeah, QGIS, it's the uh, first link here. Let me, let me show you all. So this is QGIS. It's a free and open source um, version of ArcGIS. It is a great piece of software. Uh, well, I say it's great. It's just as good as ArcGIS. How about that? <laughs> Sorry, I can't stress how much I do not like that software, but I use it and that's what matters. So QGIS is a really good one if you want to get into like the mapping side and like uh, what it's really good for is like stitching together uh, multiple different images uh, from like around the same area. Like if you want to make a mosaic or overlaying different sets of data, uh, that way you don't have to like align IR, UV and all that other, uh, any other wavelength you want yourself, uh, you can, automatically align it on that software because it's aligned uh, geographically. And as far as mapping to uh, the visual colors, is there any guidance that you have for us on that? So, yes. Uh, in terms of, so a lot of it is actually already done for you because those colors mean things. Uh, so things like uh, Chrism, uh, that has like a specific... Uh, like whenever you go to download it, it assigns specific wavelengths to colors. And then because those wavelengths are associated with different mineral mineralogic groups. So you are well on your way to getting a uh, pretty picture uh, without needing to like assign colors yourself and while not losing meaning to the colors that are there. Okay, thank you. Now let's see. Yeah, so actually, yeah, this was the last loop. Okay, I clearly don't know how PowerPoint works very well, but 
here we go. All right. So, yeah, so this example was a uh, chrism and the way chrism works is so chrism is on the same Mars reconnaissance orbiter that high rise is. Uh, and because they're on the same satellite, you know, it just travels across the surface of, or here, here's my, my surface of Mars and it just shoots down and takes pictures as it goes. Uh, so generally, if you ever find a chrism image, there is also a high rise image associated with it or a context camera, which is basically high rise, but lower resolution. Mm -hmm. So on the left here, you can see the high rise image, uh, on the top. And then on the bottom is the chrism data. So this is kind of like an RGB L image. So you take the chrism data, which will be colored. It won't have any, you won't be able to like recognize any features in it though. Like maybe if you're like really, really familiar with the site, uh, but you'll see variances in color. Then you can apply the high rise image as kind of like your detail layer. For instance, uh, in these little channels right here, uh, on the high rise version, you know, everything is, uh, the same gray color. You can't tell like what's different between this gray and this gray. Uh, but in chrism, you see, these are a lighter blue. And then you see like the top of this mountain is a, a red color. So in this instance, um, uh, if you had just the chrism here, imagine there's no detail. You only have this, these colored pixels. Um, uh, you wouldn't know that this red is a mountain and these light blues are channels. Uh, but with that chrism combined with high rise, you can see that this mountain, which say, let's say it's uh, ferrous iron is a uh, mountain is made of iron. Whereas these channels might be more uh, like a, a phyllosilicate or a sulfate mineral, for example. Uh, so it lets you know that there is a difference, you know, even between like the walls of these channels and the material above it. So chrism's resolution is around five meters per pixel. Uh, high rise is around 20 centimeters per pixel. Uh, so you do get more data coming from high rise. Uh, so you can't like go down to like, oh, this boulder is made of this, this boulder is made of this with prism, but you can get uh, general geologic uh, ideas for what the surface of Mars is made of. And then I'm gonna jump into first, uh, how to make a Hubble image. So I'm sure everyone uh, at some point has seen Hubble images at least. Uh, I know not many people have ever actually tried to download them. Uh, it's super simple though, so I, I won't spend a ton of time on it. Uh, but I'm just going to do a example really quick on ARP 87. Uh, personally, it is my favorite catalog to exist of deep space objects. And I think Hubble is amazing at them. Uh, a lot of them are way too tiny for amateurs like myself to get at, but Hubble, uh, like all the, so the ARP catalog is just really distorted galaxies like this, like the Rose Galaxy is another really popular one. Uh, but actually, sorry, while I'm here, I'll, I'll show you what Chrism looks like because I do have that tab pulled up. So here is a map of the Martian surface. Uh, and say we wanted to look, uh, let's see, let's look in this area over here. Uh, I have no, I think this is Medusa Fosse maybe. Uh, but in order to get Chrism, we're just going to click this eye right here and let me zoom in some more. Uh, let's see. I think this prism set would look fun. So I click the eye button and then I click this blue square. Uh, the blue squares just mean that they're full resolution. Uh, purple squares are like half resolution. I forget what yellow squares are. Uh, but then I'm just going to click uh, the L sensor. That's uh, just what I'm familiar with. You can also click the S. But here's an example of what prism data looks like. Uh, and you can't tell what it is, right? It's a lot of orange. Uh, there's some green, but you're not, you know, entirely sure, uh, what you're looking at right there. If I go back, uh, if we look at mafic material, uh, we have the same thing, you know, we have a lot of red, we have a lot of blue, uh, but like, what is that? So for starters in that first image, uh, the red was ferric minerals and the blue was a variety of iron minerals. And then that next one, the red was olivine or iron phyllosilicates. And then the blue is high calcium pyroxene, and then the green was low calcium pyroxene. Uh, but then here is the visible image with a little bit of IR sprinkled in there. Uh, so you can find uh, the CTX data for these. You can find uh, the high rise data, but that's essentially you know what you're dealing with. You uh, sorry, you uh, have your uh, visible and infrared images down here. You have an example of like what it looks like here. 
And then you can just download these. You can download them as a PNG. You can download them uh, as a geologic, uh, sorry, geographic uh, grid on them. So you can throw them in the like arc or queue or something like that. Uh, and then you could, if you want to, you can look at the ice map, you know, it's black, but that's it, just the way it is. You know, sometimes it's cool when you get into the northern latitudes. Uh, but that, that's the way Chrism works. It's uh, it's kind it's kind of similar to just taking a RGB photo and finding an L that matches it and then applying it. You get some really good detail and you get a lot of scientific information out of it. Uh, but for now, let's go to the Hubble Legacy Archive. So this is the HLA. Uh, it's something... Uh, most people have seen before, hopefully. Uh, but if you haven't seen it before, this is where you get Hubble data. This is what it looks like. And in order to start our journey, we just enter the site and we have our little search here in the upper left. And I'm just going to type in ARC87. I'm sorry, what was that? Was that a question? Okay. So uh, here we go. We have a whole list of things. We have uh, 21 results. Uh, so where to begin? Uh, first off, what I generally look for is something with a high exposure time. So we have this right here. And then we have uh, a spectral. So this lets me know what filters it was taken with. Uh, in this case, we have 814W, 555W, and 450W. So that is essentially red, green, blue. So what we can do is we can download this, which will be the RB, RGB image, or coincidentally enough, right above it, we have the R, G, and B right above it. And we also have the HA, which will be this F656N. Uh, now I know these things because I've worked with this data before, but if you don't know what this is, for example, like what, what do all these Fs, numbers, and Ws mean? Well, you can click display, and that'll bring up a preview of the data for you. So actually, I accidentally clicked the 814, but here is the 814 wavelength. And then if we go to the right one, this should be the RGB. There we go. So this lets you know what you're downloading before you actually go through the process of downloading it, just so you can make sure that you're downloading something that, you know, looks good and is usable. Because there have been so many times where I click display data and it's just a noisy image with like a single star in it. I have no idea what I'm looking at. So save myself some time and some storage. But in order to actually download this, uh, you just add these images to your cart. And actually let's get the RGB while we're at it. Uh, so then we go to check out our Hubble data and we just press fetch HLA data. And the first thing it'll download is a little text file. And then the rest of these will come flooding on through. So I actually have these already downloaded, so I'm going to open them real quick. So I'm opening up PixInsight now, which is what I'll be doing to combine the images. So we have our four here, and I'm actually going to leave out the hydrogen alpha for now. Because uh, I could go into how to combine hydrogen alpha, but that's, that's a whole topic in itself, you know? Uh, so here we have our blue, which is our 450. We have our green, which is our 550, and then our red, which is our 814. And to make it easier to remember, I'm just going to rename them R, G, and B. Oops. And the first thing you might run across as an issue is like, oh, you can't run uh, color calibration on these. It's uh, because the image scale is so small that it, there's no stars for it to pick up to color calibrate off of. Uh, so what I generally find works the best, I use the blue image as a linear fit for the green and the red to balance all the channels and then combine them. And it actually gets relatively similar results to just downloading the RGB, but the RGB itself isn't always available. So I'm just going to run linear fit real quick on these. And then I'm going to combine them with R, G, and B. And now, ta-da, we have our very own Hubble image. And you can go way and away with this. You can do tons of things. So like for starters, you can uh, decide if you want to do illuminance or not, right? Uh, so generally, I would say 
uh, your next step here would be to either extract the luminance from the RGB image or extract it from like the highest signal one, which would generally be the red. Uh, it's up to you. I personally think extracting the luminance from all of it is a bit better, uh, but it, you know, it's all personal preference from here. Uh, but for now, like this is what it still looks like. It's still a mostly black image. I was doing what's called a screen stretch, which, you know, uh, sorry, again, if you're familiar with astrophotography, it's not actually transforming the data, it's remaining in a linear state, uh, but I can stretch it with the histogram transformation tool and the screen transfer function tool, or actually I'm gonna do arc sine stretch because it'll be easier and we'll get some nice colors out of it. So let me just up these background values. So again, I'm going to try to not let this go on for long because I have a bad habit of picking up pictures and then kind of running away with them. So, oops, sorry, picks in sight. So uh, this is essentially what we have. Uh, your next sort of idea would be, you know, to apply, you know, a luminance to it. So say, for instance, we had uh, this this red image. Uh, say you wanted to do something like uh, you want to do some sharpening. Oh, no, my light went out. Uh, am I too dark? I'm sure I'm not, huh? Okay, anyway. Oh, you're good. We can see. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we have uh, the red here. It's been sharpened. And then uh, just do some very uh, vague. I left that in the linear. Oops. There we go. Uh, sorry. Getting all turned around. All right, there we go. Uh, so, you know, you can always, you know, do some, some contrast enhancements. Uh, let's see, do you want to do, uh, just something, you know, really simple, uh, like this? Well, let's leave it at one. Sure, why not? Um, and then this will, you know, essentially be our, if you will, so if we, uh, reopen this, and again, like if you're just looking to make a basic image, you already have it here, but uh, you can always, you know, take it a step further, do something like this. Uh, your next issue would be uh, something like these lines, and you have two options. You know, you can uh, clone stamp them, so um, do something like this where you paint in the missing areas. If you have Photoshop, uh, you really have the upper hand here because you can do something like a content uh, aware fill and that would take care of these uh, right quick. But for us Pixinsight users, this is kind of what we're stuck doing when we have areas that are not exactly uh, filled in. So I'm not gonna do these other bits. Uh, it's not the cleanest thing in the world, but you know, for a five minute tutorial on how to make a pretty picture of the galaxies, uh, why not? Oops. And, you know, you can always, you know, apply some curves, maybe uh, reduce uh, some green in it a little bit, uh, especially in this other, this part of it had a, a bit too much green, you know, ooh, increase some saturation and uh, ta-da, there you go. So, um, you might think like, oh, it's kind of obvious where you clone stamp, but even in like this one I did on the uh, presentation, it was, you know, a bit worse than, or sorry, it's a bit better than this, but in terms of clone stamping, like you can't, can't really tell. So uh, clone stamping is a great option for filling in those spots. If you see something cool that you don't want to like crop away, like for instance, if we did crop this, uh, we might miss, you know, this galaxy over here, these over here, uh, Especially, yeah, if we had to crop this out, we'd miss these guys over here. So if you're not looking to drop some galaxies, clone stamping is the way to go. But again, don't want to spend too much time on Hubble data because hopefully it's something everyone's familiar with and mainly just wanted to show you all how to get the data and what to do with it once you have it. Next up, though, is high rise. So if we go here. So here is high rise. Oops, here. So this is the catalog of high-rise images. We have 2,939 pages. 
over 70,000 images. Uh, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think Mars is like the prettiest planet in the world. And no matter where you take a picture of it, you're like guaranteed to strike gold. It's everything about it is just gorgeous. Whenever I was like practicing this presentation, I was sending some of the uh, like random photos that I was letting, you know, RNG pick for me. And it, they were they were fantastic. I love them, uh, which makes me really excited to see uh, what we're about to do, because I'm going to let fate decide what picture we're going to edit. So hopefully this doesn't go too bad, Alex. I don't want to derail the show. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so we have 2,939 pictures. So let's go to random.org. And we're going to do one, two, 2,939. And we are, okay, so I'm not going to go, that's going to be like near the very beginning of the mission. It might not even be a picture of Mars. Uh, 130, I'll take that. So if we go back to the catalog, I'm going to page 130. Ta-da, here we go. All right, what are we going to end up with? Uh, I think... Ooh, Isidus. I love Isidus. This is what I worked on. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I like that one. That's a lot of fun. Uh, that worked out nice. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, every, but look at this one. Wow. Ooh, oh, that's so pretty. pretty. Oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, uh, let it decide again between those two. <laughs> two. All right. We're doing Corrosal Crater. So. This is the red filter of this image. Uh, this is High Rise's red filter. So High Rise has a, actually this does have a giant artifact in it that might be an issue. Uh, we'll see. Let me let me check the RGB data. Nope, we're fine. So actually, it didn't have that much color barrier. Yeah, let me just check this one. Mm, I want to go with this one now. It kind of looks a little bit cooler. It has a bit more variation in it. Anyway, uh, also to get away from that artifact. So in order to download this data, you have all of your downloads right here. Uh, if you want a JPEG, they're all up here. Uh, and then you have JP2, which is essentially like a higher resolution version of all of these. Uh, the issue, though, is also what's a JP2 file? Uh, I do astrophotography and I've never run across a JP2 file. You know, I've dealt with countless other file formats, but never that. So the easiest way to download like these highest of high resolution is to use high view. So high view is uh, up here. The high view button is where we went. And I'm just going to skip registration and proceed to download and click Microsoft Windows because that is what I'm on. So then we're going to open up the software. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. All right. Hopefully installing this like eight times hasn't messed up my computer. All right. So here is what High View looks like. And what we have up here is our most important bit. And this is essentially uh, the link we put in. So put this on one side, put this on the other, and we'll go back to full screen in one second. Uh, but we're just gonna take uh, our JP2, and we're gonna go to the extra section, and we're gonna do the non-map version of the RGB. And the difference between these two is, uh, like I was saying, the green and the blue are taken with a smaller sensor. So if you look at the map version, uh, the red sensor is huge, but you only get a small sliver of color uh, down the center where you also have overlap with green and blue. Uh, so outside of that, you're not going to get color. Uh, if you did put color anywhere else, that's like in the realm of, you know, painting things. Uh, like that actually is painting in data. Uh, but you do have a very high resolution strip uh, right there in the center that we can work with. So the non-map version uh, just crops away everything that isn't in that RGB. So it makes it a bit easier to work with. So we're going to go to non-map, click it, and just drag it here, and then press enter. And then it's going to load up our image, and there she is. 
Uh, so one of the first things I like to do is go to data map and click default contrast stretch. And this is uh, what it shows like uh, by default on the, sorry, I got to drag these back. This is what it shows by like default display whenever you click on like RGB data. And actually, let me zoom in just a little bit. So I'm going to fit the image height. So here is our whole height. And if we fit it to width, uh, we zoom way in, but I, I know this level of detail isn't going to show up well across, you know, like a, a Google Meet, but like you, you can see, you know, boulders and everything else on this tiny and this little bitty blue screen up here on the left is what we're looking at of this image. It is just remarkable how like you can see channels carving and it's, it's amazing how much data they can fit into such a. I'm sorry, I could I could go on and on. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Connor. Uh, yes. So in this case, there's really no processing. You're not downloading the individual filters and then mapping, or is there other data you can map to these kinds of images? So there is. So that's what. Uh, so anything that's on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you actually can. Uh, take the individual, like, uh, so, so for, ex for this Passover, for instance, like it has probably taken a chrism image during the same time. So there is chrism data you could map to this exact data set, and then you could have a chrism overlay. Uh, but I was going to try to not get into like IRs and UV mapping, uh, partially because I know a lot of people won't have like things like ArcGIS and whatnot. Uh, but also just because, you know, uh, making a pretty picture is fun. And I was actually going to do like a, a pseudo processing of what it's like to sort of do a chrism data. But in this case, you can actually, so let's see, I think you can, uh, let me see. So there is a way like you can, uh, fiddle around with these individual bands and then download them like respectively like that. Uh, but for this case, like you can download like just R, just G, just B. Uh, but for this case, I'm just going to uh, have us create a uh, straight, let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna make just a, a nice RGB image and then we're gonna take it into PixInsight uh, mess around with the colors, some contrast, uh, do some uh, deconvolution to it and sort of get it to where like it is now like a almost like newsworthy uh, piece of, you know, Martian history, even though, like, as you saw, there were 70,000 pictures. Uh, most of them, in, including this one, have probably never been touched before. Uh, although this is Isidus, so maybe it has. This is a very high interest area, but we'll see for now. So we have our little navigator over here. We are gonna, let's zoom in uh, to, so I'm gonna fit it to width. And then I just gotta find an area I like. Sorry, I have a giant tower of boxes over here holding my camera up so I can see. Uh, let's see. I think uh, we could go down here to the crater field. I think something like that looks, yeah, I, I really like the way that looks. also like that framing. Uh, so generally, I also miss, mess with the uh, low values of the uh, histogram. This is something you can do when you bring it into PixInsight, uh, but it's also just something I like to do initially uh, here just to get it sort of started for us. Uh, so I just drag these bars and generally what I find is like dragging the base of the red bar to the base of the blue histogram and then putting like uh, the green a little bit behind it and the blue a little behind it ends up with results I like. That is just what works out for me. Uh, your mileage may vary sort of thing, uh, but actually, I don't, where did my other highs go? I need to relink these. Uh, oh, there they are. So.
so yeah, like we got the classic like dark red Martian, uh, and then we have blue. And Tim actually asked me earlier what this blue is. Uh, so the blue is actually uh, finer material on uh, that's getting picked up by high rise. That is what that blue is. And actually, I'm going to reduce those shadows. Actually, and also if you you can drag a box, and that actually shows you the histogram uh, for that specific area we're working in. But yeah, whole lots of things you can do. And for instance, uh, so this box is 4,000 by 5,400 pixels. So these are very, very high resolution things that we're we're working with here. So we're gonna we're gonna have a good time. Uh, all right. So I like the way this looks as like a jumping off point. So we're going to go to save and then we just, I'm going to name it Mars five because it's the fifth time I've done this. Uh, and I'm just going to change the scale to one. So this is just letting the program know, Hey, export it at a one-to-one -one scale. Don't compress it and don't expand upon it. And we're just going to save and then Oh no, did it crash on me? Oh, it did. Let's see, it should still be in the same spot. Oh darn. Let's see. Uh -huh. Right around there is close enough. I'm not going to fiddle with the histogram. We'll do that in a second. Uh, so now the software is finicky uh, or temperamental. That's a better word. Uh, so when you press save, hmm, let me try one more time. You know what? Let me, tr let me try that let me try a let me try a smaller region that might help let's see uh, so this should be fine it's fully loaded save Mars five. All right, now please. There we go. All right. Uh, you know, maybe it was I was typing PNG at the end of it. I'm not sure. Uh, I had a, I had a crash before. Uh, I'm not sure. Not sure why it does, but. Sometimes it works. <laughs> All right, let's see. So it shouldn't take too much longer. But the benefit of this software is it allows you to essentially save this tiny, tiny portion of the image rather than save the gigantic, uh, you know, half gigabyte uh, or, you know, more version that has, you know, 100,000 pixels in it, you know, in this case, it's 50,000 pixels long, which is actually a surprisingly small, almost, in terms of uh, Martian images from high rise. And I'm actually, I don't want to click anything, but it shouldn't take that long. Mm. Okay, we're improvising. We're going to the other images. Connor, Connor, could yeah. you go to one of the ones you saved previously? Yeah, so that's what I'm pulling okay. out. Okay. Uh, so, oh, did it just come through? Okay, it's coming through. There we go. All right, that works out. So, here we go. So, just to give you an idea of what I like to do to these pictures, uh, so let me exit out of all these things. Uh, so first thing I like to do is apply deconvolution. 
So you can actually download the point spread function for high rise, uh, but it's really simple. It's that. It's a very, very, very tiny point spread function. Uh, just to give you an idea also of like, because Mars has so little atmosphere, uh, there isn't actually much uh, disturbance that we have like compared to Earth like on a point spread function. So to give you an idea, like uh, that's probably not even showing up for you all very well. Uh, but on my end, I can like, it makes some boulders show up just a wee bit better. Uh, so for the uh, presentation, I'm not going to run it, but uh, for uh, the PSF, it is 0.7, uh, 2 and 1. That's what I run with uh, whenever I've loaded it in before. Uh, but I will do some histogram equalization. So uh, that is way too much. Everything's glowing. So... We are going to make sort of the larger areas, especially uh, some of these craters uh, that are a bit older. We're going to make those stand out just a little bit. Instagram equalization. Man, our computer slower. Nope, never mind. There it goes. I'm going to say, are they that much slower when you stream? But uh, and then we are going to I'll do a little bit of a histogram transformation as well uh, because I didn't because it crashed. <laughs> so let's see. So bring up uh, red maybe a little bit and do the green and then maybe something like that. Mm. You know, there's, there's what, a hundred ways to skin a cat or something like that. I think that's the saying. Uh, there's there's loads of ways you can take this, uh, but what I would say is one of the more crucial steps is uh, color masking. So I, I like to color mask off the uh, blue and the red separately uh, and manipulate those with curves. So if we apply the cyan mask and we open up Eric Cole's favorite tool, curves, make sure we have the Mars selected. Uh, I like to brighten up the uh, blues a little bit and then lower uh, the white balance some. Mm, and then maybe just add a smidge more uh, of green into it. Uh, hide that mask, apply it, and then invert the same tool and then deal with the reds. Uh, so I generally find you know, those are just just a little too red for me. Uh, maybe just upping the overall brightness uh, and re uh, maybe reducing some of the blues in them. Yeah, so it's more of like a maroon color. Uh, applying that and then just doing uh, with no mask attached, just doing like a general contrast curve, something like that and add a little bit of saturation and ta-da we now have a beautiful picture of the martian surface that has probably never been made before uh, just like that and if we zoom to the actual pixel scale you can see individual boulders pretty much everywhere they are covering the surface we have some dunes over here We've got a bunch of ancient craters everywhere uh, just to show you some of the other ones I had worked on earlier. So these were all also randomly selected uh, by good old random.org. So here are some gullies. Uh, this is probably my favorite one that ended up coming up. Uh, I might upload these all to Drive and put them in like the chat link or something if anyone wanted to download these and use them as wallpapers. Uh, here's another one, just some crazy rock formations. Uh, this one, a crater with some dunes filling in it. Uh, but with that said, I would love to take a chance to take some questions from the audience, uh, from the host, uh, tell you all more about some of these great high rise pictures. And, you know, I, I would love to see what some of y'all can do with them. Uh, I've been working with these things for years. It would be, it'd be great to see what, what other people do with them, you know, but thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, great presentation. I'm, I'm tempted to go out there uh, immediately after the show and see what some of these high-rise pictures 
can yield. But it sounds like there are literally hundreds of thousands of different uh, eight by ten images we can make out of this. Yeah, if we're and, interested. And actually, that uh, reminds me. So I did mention that I was gonna. Sorry, Eric. It, hearing you reminded me that I was gonna do a uh, like pseudo chrism just to show you kind of what it's like. So let me just open up like. Uh, or is my most recent image, uh, what is it, the, the North American Nebula? So I'm just going to apply the uh, luminance from one of these images, for example. So uh, for instance, our most recent image here is, uh, oh, no, I can't see the resolution. <laughs> it's, uh, there we go. So it's 40, 48 by 4,800. So let me just crop this to those dimensions. 40, 48 by 4,800. Uh, it's going to be a little too big, but that's fine. Uh, I'm going to extract the L. And so just imagine that this North American nebula picture is the uh, you know crazy rainbow-colored uh, chrism image. Instead, we're going to take our, our Mars high-rise image, and now we have our pseudo-chrism high-rise data conjunction showing the really cool mineralogical assemblage of this area in very pseudo fashion or, you know, iron oxides over here. But that's, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, if you're looking to make a chrism image and that would be great. I don't think I've ever seen amateurs really going out and making chrism images. So it'd be great to see, Someone like you do it, Eric, that has like a bunch of experience, especially in terms of like manipulating uh, colors and whatnot. Because did are the chrism images uh, spe specific to a geographical area on Mars? Yes, they are. So you can explore uh, the exact. So th this was the uh, the chrism database. So you can just uh, so let's see if we zoom out some. Do you have to match them, or do does it know that oh that particular image is coming from this particular chrism? So uh, generally, you will have to match them. So like, uh, so you have to have pretty precise coordinates on both the chrism is image and the uh, high rise image. Yes, but at the same time, luckily, a lot of the observations are kind of uh, paired with each other. So like, uh, you have all of your uh, longitude and latitudes uh, right here. They give you all that sorts of information. It also gives you like the year and the day, so you can combine uh, the exact year and day uh, from the same Passover uh, to make sure you get like your shadow angles and everything like that correct as well. Hmm. Yeah, here you go. Let's see. The following links provide direct access to the PDS uh, of the calibrated chrism data in this observation, as well as the CTX and high rise images coordinated with it. So in this case, uh, it directly links you to the chrism and high rise data for uh, this particular data set. Connor, do you uh, post your images on AstroBin or on your own site? Uh, of Mars? No, <laughs> I don't. Uh, those are those are all just uh, either uh, research related, so uh, not with the idea of making pretty pictures in mind, or I don't didn't even know that if they were allowed on AstroBin. <laughs> Because, like, while I love this picture, uh, I'm not sure if Sal would love this picture sort of thing, you know? Actually, I can't think of any reason he wouldn't. Why wouldn't he? I mean, I it's mean, public yeah. It's public data, right? Exactly. Uh, and well, as long as you gave the, the proper reference where it mm -hmm. came from, then sure. Yeah, and that's that's what I love about this is that it's all, you know, free data, and hopefully – after seeing this, like, oh, my light came back on. Hopefully after seeing this, like a lot of people realize you don't need to be, you know, a scientist to mess with this stuff. It's just, it exists and you go download it and then you have fun with it, you know? It's it's a learning experience. It's an exploration, you know? Uh, like in this image, you know, it's, you get to see these boulders and the streaks they're making as they slide down this mountain on another planet. like. They're all just so, so cool, and they all have something unique in them. Are there any questions from the audience? I don't know. You know, I don't see anything posted over on uh, YouTube. I, I think everyone is just fascinated 
you know, yeah. <laughs> at your presentation. Oh, yeah. happy to, to know that there's a lot of, uh, we're all good image processors or we're, we're trying to be good image processors. Mm -hmm. And part of the, um, part of the trick is gathering the image in the first yeah. place, the raw data. And what we don't realize is that there's a lot of raw data out there that we could be using. We could yeah, be processing Hubble pictures if we wanted to. Exactly. Like, like Hubble, Hubble pictures are, Hubble pictures are fun. Uh, and I think they're like a great jumping off point, but like there are so many satellites, you know, like this, this is just one of them. Uh, like you can do something like this with all of them. Like you could do this with Juno data. You could do this with Cassini data. I think what makes this unique is that it is of the surface, whereas things like Juno and Cassini are more like close up cloud details. Um, uh, but there's just so many great satellite data sets out there that just exist that you can just go ahead, download and bring in the PixInsight, you know? Well, actually, there's another big database, the Murkowski Space Telescope Archive. I mm -hmm. actually put a link in the chat uh, and that has images from all the big telescopes on the ground and, and the satellite telescopes, mm -hmm. but they're, they're deep sky images yeah. but you can do the same thing download it and process it and yeah make your own image yeah oh and the thing is, there's uh i think another thing is you know a lot of people think you know oh maybe there isn't uh like i don't know how to work with like satellite data from mars and or they think like i know there's like a big misconception with astrophotography like from people outside the hobby they're like oh everything's just like painted in like those are renderings it's like people see pictures of like the Martian surface and they might think, oh, that's a rendering, you know, the same sort of thing, even if they are an astrophotographer. Uh, it's like, no, these are all, you know, real pictures. And you can, just like you would with astrophotography, go download them yourself, edit them yourself, do the same techniques to them, you know? Um, Eric, uh, you mentioned that you dropped the, um, the link to the big database in the chat did you drop that in the um meeting chat at google meets or over in the one for um yeah the, in uh, in the meet yeah let's get that could you could you paste it over into the um uh, sure uh, this comments is, this for the is, youtube this is the archive for all the space telescopes and all the big ground space telescopes i'll put it over here okay i hope people can see my face again Actually, I don't, was my face showing before? I don't even know. Yes, it was. Okay. You were accompanying. We've moved you around a little bit. Tim, Tim is in charge tonight, everybody. Tim, so, you better make me look pretty. I so, swear. so Tim was Tim was That's careful. A tough job, to, baby. Out of the way. Okay. Um, and next week, Terry's going to be in charge. So if anything messes up next week, well, and it, it's because we're getting redundancy here, so that the next time there's a power outage in in one part of the world. Uh, you know, we, we've got other people backing us up. So uh, good luck, Terry, next week. Uh, that's when Ron Brecher is <laughs> going to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see over in the chat area that uh, Eric has gotten his uh, his post, his link in so that we can all find um, the database to all the other pictures. Often I see over in Cloudy Nights, somebody is asking if they can put the images from one night together with the images from another night or from one telescope with another telescope or one camera with another camera. And the point is, yeah, you can do all that stuff. You can take a Hubble photo and add your data to it. Um, mm -hmm. And it can be done. Uh, Bob Gendler does a marvelous job of doing this. He's been doing it for years, being taken Hubble data and, and putting it together with other people's data. We had uh, Joe Pasquale come in and tell us about how he does that earlier. So yeah, you can do all that stuff. You've got, I mean, even if it's cloudy, don't worry about it being cloudy. Just go to the archive, grab a grab a picture of, of Mars or, or Jupiter, and process it. That's all you've got to do. Um, Connor, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, do you have a website or anything, a Facebook page? That yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say the best way to get in touch with me is through Instagram. It's uh, cosmic.spec. Um, you're sending me a message on there. I'm really responsive. Uh, I know a lot of people on Instagram will like just let their message request build up. Can't do it. Uh, if you send me a message or anything, I, I'll respond to it. And I'll, I'll be glad to help you with downloading any sorts of weird data sets from any other telescopes or satellites. Okay. 
Um, anything else we need to say, or is it about time to say good night? Okay. Good night, everybody. Thanks for being here. Come back next week with Ron Brecher. He's going to tell us how to match our telescopes up to the types of imaging we're going to do, be doing and stuff like that. Tim, you ready to sign us out? Good night, everybody.